I'm right. looking at the titles of these songs, and there's some titles I don't even uh, um, remember. Um, well, those might be the titles I just assigned them okay. to what I think you've named them. Because we never had an actual CD produced, no. which is weird because that was our wheelhouse was producing CDs and artwork and all. It was, but as I said, I just discovered all the uh, artwork and all that stuff for it, so uh, I'll, I'll be able to show it to you. Uh, That's great. Like, you're hearing these songs again for the first time? I'll be seeing some artwork for the first time, maybe. Yeah. Because this is the album that we were really focused on music at the time. We really weren't visual artists, right? We didn't yeah. care too much. And I think it's a, it's a good uh, topic to discuss, whether we say it now or at the end, what, what actually happened at the end of doing these albums. Uh, it's not only this album, but it's other albums I've done. Just sort of like you end up with uh, a lot of songs done, but then there's like a whole other uh, side of it uh, as to uh, even the album that I've done presently. Um, it seems to be the e the easiest and the funnest thing is to actually do the album, mm -hmm. but what you're going to do with the album, how are you going to put it out, uh, what you're going to do about selling to put it out uh, becomes uh, this whole other uh, uh, mass of uh, stuff that uh, uh, I've always found like overwhelming, and I, I, it doesn't surprise me that there's no CD done at the end of this uh, this thing, because you you if you don't have a band or uh, you've sort of been in this cave or the studio for like two years and you sort of get out and finish it and 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 experience the sunshine of uh, of being done, but then. W where is it going to go? Like, what are you going to do with it and stuff like that has always been sort of my existential question that uh, to this day I'm still trying to answer. But that, you know, and <clears throat> really that is the crux of this whole series, right? The fact that once you're finished a project, put it aside, move on. You, you never cared for promotion, for playing live, playing these things live. Which I think, you know, I heard the Beatles say, is that now that we don't have to play live, we don't have to worry about reproducing these pieces in front of an audience and failing. So now we can produce whatever we like and, and just be happy that it's a painting you hang on the wall. Absolutely. I, I mean, technically for me, it was always, uh, uh, I think it was something that evolved over my time, sort of doing all, all my music and stuff like that. But um, uh, sort, sort of when you... My indulgence is is in the middle of uh, putting it together. That's that's what I love. Uh, to go out and play it live means uh, one would have to uh, spend, uh, especially for me, many days uh, relearning what we did in the studio and uh, and trying to duplicate it every day in practice and stuff like and that. Lead the magic out of it and suck the magic <laughs> out of it. Yeah, and just stress me out that I I, I can't sort of uh, do an hour and just the whole thing and. Uh, the whole thing of too much Byron is just too much me. Uh, I think it's too much me, and just to have a whole hour uh, to do a, a, a set and stuff like that always, uh, I, I think, was the beginning of just too much Byron. I mean, I even feel it today in this album that I just finished. Uh, um, there's uh, 17 tracks that I've, I've done, and I, I love sort of being in the middle of it, but when I always sort of uh, am done something, I step back and there's some horror to it because it's just too much me. It's just, uh, and when I play 17 tracks, it's like my artwork that I'm doing. So I told you, I, I, I do a piece of artwork a day. So um, I'm coming up to the end of, the, of this year, we're in December, and uh, I've almost done over 300 pieces of artwork again this year. And I was sort of looking through it uh, the past couple of days. And although there's some really nice stuff in there, it's just, it just becomes overwhelming to me how much it's just too much me. And I think it uh, there's a lot of distaste that I have about uh, uh, wanting to sort of stick myself out there uh, like that, uh, where it's just uh, so much me. Um, I, I, I find... Um, Slightly repulsive, so uh, uh, yeah, that's what I always uh, end up sort of dealing with at the end of an album. Well, <laughs> with, with that being exposed, uh, we have listened to Emily, and we've listened to the third track, Games. So what we're going to do now is listen to the one that's sandwiched between them. This one, and what I want to do here, this was, I call, I don't know if it was your title or not, but it, it's certainly in the lyrics, Cooler Heads. Um, 
I said to Byron before we started the taping today, I said, oh yeah, the country song. And I always have a tendency to categorize stuff, whether it's correct or not, as the country song or the, the doo-wop song or the whatever song. Um, so for me, this was the album's country song. What would make it country to you? Before we were about to listen well, to it. Well, the, the funny thing is that Byron would always come to me with each song, because each song had a specific personality, and say, I have an idea in, in the chorus, if you remember, that a guy's like playing those old time like trap set or the, the rims of the drums, you know, like to keep it really moving. So, not only uh, did I spend two years sort of uh, doing stuff in the studio, but uh, you had actually uh, other people that actually. <laughs> paid your bills for you, right? <laughs> Some yeah. real, real true, uh, true customers that came in. A million people have had Project Studios, so a million people can relate to having musicians coming in one by one doing their songs, and then having you know their main tenant. Um, so, <laughs> so I think at the time, so would uh, I don't know whether this song was being done, but there were a few country uh, people. Um, that, that were sort of in our orbit and stuff like that. And you had one uh, individual, uh, would this be around Les? Uh, his name was Les, eh? There was a, a, a gentleman we had met called Les that uh, wanted to employ your services at mm-hmm. your studio. Would this be around the same time, that sort of ennui of uh, country? Because uh, he was a, a, a guy from Western Canada, Alberta. Originally, yeah. Right, and so he came uh, to you with all these... Um, can we say country songs and stuff like that? Yeah, you know, Les is going to be a whole episode on his own because it was so weird, the, the situation we all had. Les was a singer-songwriter <laughs> that worked in the government, and he would be traveling across Canada, and when he came to Ottawa, he would employ myself and then eventually myself and Byron to interpret his artwork, his music, um, so yeah, that was all around this time. You know, I, Byron lived in my basement, and also I engaged him to either sing or play with me on people's music. Like he said, you don't want to just be always doing it all yourself because then it sounds like well a one guy band, which is not very interesting. So Byron and I would affect these alter egos to play on other people's music. I was Adrian Mayweather, and he was. Simon Sticklebush. <laughs> and we would yeah. tell people, oh, it's a legal thing. We can't be our real names in your album. Yeah, so it was the, it was the whole Spinal Tap thing. Boy, it's got a, a lot of English accents. Uh, but yes, by we are digressing that ba- at the end of the day, what I love about this song too, you will hear at the beginning this kind of barrel house piano thing and Byron desperately wanted to have this boogie woogie piano going but couldn't play it real time, so he spent a long time step timing in this boogie woogie piano part. Yeah, um, can we play it first? And then, <laughs> and then I'll uh, sort of. I'm gonna cut a lot of this out anyway. <laughs> Stuff I don't like. Yeah, yeah, I hope. Okay, so we're gonna take a listen to Cooler Heads Prevail here, track number two from the album Bite Down Hard.
I don't even know what uh, that song is about. Uh, just listening to it, I, I remember doing it. So yeah, the piano was that me sort of ultimately. Yes. Some, there was no it contribution took you a long from time. I would guess. You know, uh, here's something. You remember Steve Geyer? He was a friend of ours. He recorded with me a lot. That's how I got to know him. But he was a piano teacher, and so we approached him and said, "You think you can do this?" And you know, love Steve. Uh, you know, it, that's a hard part to play real time. Like you got to be a pretty good to keep up with that tempo and so it didn't quite end up being what you were looking for so like most things you just said I'll, I'll do it myself and it took you a while but that's a lot of sequencing like for a non keyboard player to get through those roles like <laughs> yeah it's incredibly robotic uh, listening to it all now um, I certainly would arrange it a lot more differently uh, but I think uh, first and foremost the piano part so I grew up obviously there's a couple Beatles songs uh, and other songs of that time um, sort of the uh, uh, the stuff from the 50s like Jerry Lee Lewis and well that has an old Richard. piano sound very yeah 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 um, thumb tacks on well the yeah it was the, those tack pianos uh, I think of Lady Madonna with that uh, yeah. just that wicked wicked uh, uh, thing uh, uh, I think of uh, back in the USSR, you can really hear him rolling the uh, th that stuff. Um, so, but it was always sort of the walking piano and stuff like that. And uh, the, that was the driving force for you in this song. Uh, well, it would be to, so I can hear the chorus. So I think musically, for sure, I can hear the bass starting to walk on the chorus. So. Um, I, I can hear myself thinking, yeah, I'll... Uh, I apologize for that. That mix was rough. Like, you heard those mids to lows. They were they just... You know, we had to deal with certain uh, technology. We couldn't... The compression, it, it was... It was tough. So, yeah. So, I, I, I do remember when we were mixing. And um, it, so, uh, for me, uh, uh, when we do stuff and we do... Um, we're always creating. Uh, it's very much of the moment, at the moment. Uh, it's very organic. It is sort of what you bring to with you in the studio and stuff like that. And I remember when we were mixing this album, that uh, the weekend that we sort of uh, were able to get, because uh, I think you got a couple of extra uh, pieces of hardware for us to mix. However, the when the time came that we were supposed to mix, um, I remember that you, uh, uh, at the time, had a... Um, bad migraine I, I think you, you almost had like one of those two days it was very difficult for you to come down and uh, sort of hear stuff I don't know whether you remember that I, I yeah I was just bullshitting I just didn't want to hang out with you <laughs> which was probably the real use uh, but no I, I remember when it finally came down to mix in, in the, that sort of space of time that we had or you had allotted to mix this album when we had to mix a song in itself was uh, um, a piece of uh, work that we had to do together because the board that we had we had eight tracks running and probably some virtual tracks that were running through your board mm -hmm. um, um, it's not like today where you can automate all your changes and stuff like that uh, you actually had to do a performance while you were mixing do you remember that absolutely yeah anybody so before you know the advent of DAWs, like officially, when, when you had tape and you had things on tape, you now have to play those back every time to mix. And those tracks are going back through your mixing board and you have to manually adjust those because we didn't have flying faders at the time. We had a Studio Master 16 by 16 by 4 by 2 probably throw up a picture here now of the Studio Master, but Byron and I went and we had the drum machine and the keyboards and, and we'd have to, the two of us, you know, work those mixes, right? Pushing things up and going, remember that one? Remember that? 
<laughs> yeah, and we were uh, ostensibly uh, the tape uh, or the uh, the master tape that was rolling uh, was a tape that uh, had been used um, again and again and again. And so uh, uh, it was sort of a very sort of delicate operation, I remember, because we didn't, uh, I mean, anything that would go wrong, especially with the timing, because we were using a, a lot of uh, uh, virtual instruments and the time code and stuff like that, mm -hmm. tapes over uh, a period of time, stretches and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So I think there was sort of a real, a very delicate operation. But when we mixed, I think we mixed on two different formats. We mixed on the... Uh, Dat tape at the time <clears throat> was that? Would that be correct? Dat yeah, I think so. I remember Kristen got me a uh, was it Sony DA30? I think yeah, because I have versions of of, the, of this album on mm -hmm. that. Right. So that would have been our first. We felt pretty cool. We had a digital little DAT yeah. deck, uh, but we also put it reel to reel. If I don't. Yeah, I think so. I, I I think so. So yeah. So there was sort of so when we always mixed, there was this. All of this, it was like a Rube Goldberg sort of thing. Everything was just sort of going and uh, I'm... <laughs> Marbles falling off. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there would be smoke coming out of the bottom of the door of the studio <laughs> as we were trying to record. And of course, uh, we were probably <clears throat> indulging in other things too uh, while we were... <laughs> so, it was... It was uh, uh, I think that was the only way we can get through it. You know, it was, it was, it was exciting though, because you felt like, right. here we go, man. Yeah. Not so, like today when you just go... Bounce. Very much so. <laughs> uh, so it was sort of all hands on deck and sort of as we do it. And so, yeah, so that's one of the things I, I, I hear uh, when I listen to. So the polyphony sort of of the instruments and stuff like that. There's a lot of virtual instruments going on. That song, I hear more virtual instruments than I do real instruments. Uh, I think there's like an acoustic guitar, maybe a bass, and mm -hmm. uh, your guitar. I, I what I what I felt most for there was the drum mix. I thought it was really lost, but I mean that was the limitations we were dealing with. There wasn't a lot of, um, you know, uh, we didn't isolate frequencies a lot and you know enhance them or whatever. We we just kind of we had to get through it as best we could. Um, I did listen to this album after we had done uh, on cassette on a ghetto blaster for a few few months in the summertime. And I don't ever remember it being as wet sounding. Mm -hmm. um, it was ha had a dryness to it. You know, one other thing is that this, I, I'm not sure at what point that these mixes were listening to. I'm sure they were final mixes, but at some point, I remember John Dewar went in and he touched it up a bit, you know, and, and he yeah. sort of made it better in some way, fate, shape, or form. I'm not sure if these are post John or. This is what he enhanced it. I don't I'm not sure. Yeah, it's it's hard to know. Um, uh, listening to it now, there's a lot of things I, I I and I'm sure there's a lot of things you hear that you probably sort of you might do differently as far as yeah. Uh, but the, but, but you look at it like high school going. No, no, I, I love it. Absolutely. So there's but but that but we're listening to context, right? Mm -hmm. And we're trying to put some context to these mixes and stuff like that. Uh, I think there's a lot of I'm listening to this song, and I'm listening to a lot of lyrics in this song. Um, I think I was getting too, too, maybe one uh, step a bit too smart. I'm hearing a lot of cool lines and stuff like that, but it's very, um, um, uh, like the meter. It's the, well, that's the like I think the piano drove that right because yeah. it's almost like it's it's got diarrhea right. of the mouth. Of it. Right. So I, I tell you what, my favorite line in the whole thing, and when I think about it, it's one of my favorite lines of all time is. The best laid plans come busted. Like the the duality of that line is so good. I love it. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, I uh, I think I heard it. Um, I'm uh, intrigued by the um, the backgrounds and the amount of backgrounds that I was uh, really indulging yeah. myself yeah. in. Uh, the whole song is just uh, me sort of doing backgrounds and stuff yeah. like that. I noticed that too, and, and and it's funny. You have these little flashbacks. I have these flashbacks to hearing, you know, as you're singing through, and I can hear you through the floor because I can hear all the time you're singing. Just that, 
I remember it, it just gives you that thought again. Oh my God, I remember hearing this over and over and over. Because you, how many time tracks did you put down there? Probably four to eight. Probably so. So uh, I think I've told you this before without doing on the video, but it, it is sort of important that I, I, I do say this because it, it it is an important album. So I, I I listen to myself and and there's a lot that I I I. I I smile over listening to my vocals mm -hmm. and all the background vocals, but there is an issue too about when I listen to it that it's it's all me and um, uh, it's not a negative thing to my head. It's that there's just sort of one texture to my voice, um, mm -hmm. and to me this is sort of one of the issues about doing uh, music on, by myself as mm -hmm. opposed to have other people sing with you uh, that bring other textures, <clears throat> uh, bring a gravitas to the vocals and stuff like that. Uh, there's, there's. Uh, um, I understand why I probably started bringing in vocalists to help me do backgrounds mm -hmm. like Dave Wilson and stuff like that. So there was an album that I grew up in the 80s uh, with, especially when they came out with the Walkmans, I remember growing up, um, and it was the solo album. So I always think solo albums are so hard to do because of uh, just making the vocals interesting. Paul McCartney did his, uh, it was probably his first real solo album that he did in 71 called Ram. And Ram is a wonderful album, especially when you listen to uh, his vocal work and his background vocal work. Now he had his wife with him, which is an extraordinary thing that he stuck her in the studio too. Uh, just but to hear the sound of uh, Paul's voice with uh, w with his wife's voice, like a female voice. Um, there are just some outstanding tracks that he did vocally, and I, I always loved listening to that album. That was Paul's psychedelic country sort of. Uh, uh, era where he had just broken up with the Beatles and I, I guess they they gone off to Scotland and stuff like that. I never put this together before. People in the future, maybe this will fill in a gap because as you worked forward, you seem to always want that female muse, that female counterpart to your stuff as opposed to like an, another guy or three people or different people all the time. You seem to look for that yeah, uh, I guess maybe internally, yeah, I've never, uh, yeah, I, I don't hang around. you're looking for or something? Maybe, um, uh, but McCartney had this thing with these sort of melodic vocal doodles and all. Uh, that's really what I love listening to. And if you listen to some of the tracks on Ram, uh, it's outstanding. Even that long lost sort of, which I think is one of his best songs, Uncle Albert, I think it's just uh, a... Four or five minutes of just pure uh, to think that he got a single out of it, and the and the song's got about three or four different uh, big musical oh, changes like to it. The run, it's way. stupidly good, and it's, it's it's ridiculous when you think about the separate parts, but just how he sort of got them to fit and stuff like that, and all the little vo vocal work. So that's sort of uh, um, uh, me uh, wanting to fill it up with vocals. So th this is sort of my first attempts at really sort of trying to do something proper. I can hear it. I can hear just way too much of me right now. Um, it's just uh, seems like a blamage of uh, way too much. So, uh, uh, but I can hear it. So, so that was Cooler Heads Prevail. Yeah. Now, just give me quickly on the chorus. Cooler Heads Prevail, will her love for him prevail? Has her love for him gone stale? Okay, I got stale. Yeah, she's cold and tired, and uh, and I don't know what the rest. Yeah, you're gonna. I don't know. I can't remember it. <laughs> I have to get the lyrics and stuff like that. I don't even know what it's about. Like it, it just seems like just gobbledygook word, word, word uh, uh, just me throwing out lines and stuff like that. I can't. Well, it's, it's, uh, it sounds like you know. A lot of other writer stuff in, in a Byronic way. It's it's the same lament. Sure, and I love pop songs. I, I love all that Paul Simon stuff. Although Paul Simon was a uh, 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 really connected his dots lyrically, but um, I love going outside the sort of uh, Moon June and, and stuff. Uh, the the normal sort of nomenclature to pop songs. So. Yeah, I, I, I can hear potential in that song. Mm -hmm. Almost makes me want to go out and uh, uh, do like a three-piece Skittles well, that's version of that you, song. You can certainly strip it down and play it live and people go, yeah, sounds great. Yeah, because uh, the first thing I hear, uh, sorry, without sort of uh, going on and about the same song, but I can hear the chorus and I know the the thing that switches, it switches into, into minor. Uh, I think it goes into the B minor, G, E thing. Uh, 
um, I can hear sort of that switch. Uh, but the drums, that sort of skedaddle that you got going in the chorus. Uh, skedaddle. Yeah. Like that's, I'll remember it forever is the skedaddle. <laughs> it's true. I, I can almost hear the brushes. But uh, so, and it's got your guitar on the end. Uh, I, I, so what does it make you think, th listening to your guitar? Uh, does it make you want to hide or... Um, no, actually, the the way I laid hard on the whammy bar at the end there, I kind of like that because that that to me is a Byronic twist to a, a a guitar out part that would just be a standard thing, you know, that that yeah. weird whammy where it's n not in or out of key. It's just weird. I thought that was that was more of a. a fitting part than, than when I play straight notes. Now what about your guitar solo uh, in the middle? Like I'm no soloist. You know I, I say that. I'm no soloist. It sucks. And you know, I'm always feeling like, oh my god, this guy's drawing the Mona Lisa and I just come up and fart it on it. <laughs> well, it's, it's it's interesting about guitar solos, like, like when I hear it, because like... I'm it, not a soloist, mate. Well, it seems like such a simplistic trope. To, to sort of finish off a chorus and then get into that guitar solo. Well, that, that was pretty formulaic, that whole thing. Well, for sure. Yeah. And I'm listening to it like, like uh, um, and I think I remember uh, maybe uh, considering a key change at that point to actually bring the guitar up uh, uh, and, and make it sound bigger. Boof it up a third or something like that. But I, I I've always had this thing about doing pop songs that uh, that in itself is a big trope, eh? Uh, moving uh, the key change up, uh, especially then. But then I, you know, the other day sometimes was, it works. Though. I was listening to Penny Lane and it, the, 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 the go up the it next one. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. Have it, you yeah. Go, oh my God, they missed a brilliant opportunity. We always, I know Byron and I, we're suckers because of that stuff we love. The, the contrivances in the studio, the way you resolve things, turnarounds that we love from other bands, like the modulation, like so many other things, like the backwards guitar. It's not like it's new, but, but it works in certain situations. They do, and that's something that sort of, uh, like when I hear that, and um, I kind of kick myself because uh, I just have this thing on certain things about music that I, I, I just think that they are tropes uh, especially mm -hmm. when you're dealing with country and stuff like that like a meme of yourself. Uh, yeah, yeah a meme and I don't want to indulge like I'm always trying to rip those things apart uh, but then as I said when I listen to Penny Lane I, I think uh, um, I, I really don't like myself for having that sort of attitude because it's it's almost like out of spite it's like no I'm just not going to do go there right but, and then you take away the potential beauty of it yeah pie. and then and then as I said when I heard Penny Lane the other day I was just like oh my god like how stupid mm -hmm. can I be and that's the first thing I thought of is is when he moved it up I just said I sh or you take the extreme of something like uh, what's uh, Brian Wilson's uh, is it um, uh, it's off Pet Sounds. God only knows. Yeah, he's got four or five key changes in there, and there's no other song like it because of it, and it's genius. But what? How did, you, right. how did you come up with that? Yeah. So, so, so then, as a pop guy, especially today, you know, and we again we go over this this trope that I've heard about that the chorus comes in the first fifteen seconds and stuff like that. Sometimes I I think now, uh, you know, I uh, even just us talking about it, I almost want to like move up uh, a part of one of my songs that I'm doing today. But sometimes I think people don't, um, uh, those things, do you really have to listen to a song a few times to really sort of get the key change, to sort of uh, follow the musicality of it? Or is somebody just going to be uh, clicking away, uh, looking for something that sort of, do you know what I mean? Can you? I, well, I can tell you exact perfect example. In the middle of that song, we're listening back. I knew that was coming when that little pump. A little push beat, right? And and I find it interesting because it's always neat to have some type of little signature in a song that only happens once. And that was the one he goes, uh, you know, oh, fuck, I can't even. It's the beginning of the verse. Uh, right. And it's funny because the first time that I had a chance to listen to the alien, the rabbit, the monkey off the alien, the rabbit, the monkey, when John Neuer called me and said, "You got to come listen to this." And in the middle of the alien route, you hear that, tap, tap, same thing. I thought, 
We love this. We love that little signature, and typically it's drums, because people love drums, and they're something you can catch on when it does something awkward or different than the rest of it. And that was that little different part for me. Like, as far as, because I love percussion, love drums, so I look for those little things. Every song, I can always find a little spot where I go, that's where I hung the Christmas decoration. And you remember that. Did you hear that before, or is that just sort of came out of your DNA? It, well, how many times have I heard this song? How many times have I worked on it? This is one of the problems... <laughs> I, I, I want to discuss at length at some point, maybe if it's own, its own thing. There's this weird phenomena that you have to deal with as a musician. You're into your song a week in. You're never going to hear it the same from the scratch again. So when I'm working on a drum bit and I put that in there, I may have worked on it for three hours to get it just sounding right. It never sounds as cool to me again as the first time you hear it. Yes, constantly dealing with that. Uh, presently, when I mix a song, uh, I, as I told you, sometimes I have to sort of not listen to it for a week. I got to get uh, my minor issues out of my head. But you can't. Uh, I can't. It. I can't erase it. How, however, as I told you, uh, this past album, I've come across some songs. Uh, as I told you, I went to that globe where I spun it and just was picking titles out of my hard drive uh, with all these unfinished material, and I would come across songs that. I would be played to that uh, would have a lot of production to them and I can't remember a f thing about them and I'm it's like I'm listening to a song for the first time that I've done in my life uh, very profound experiences uh, to listen to something that you have no memory of and stuff like that and it's, um, it's not that uh, uh, I'm probably am missing some brain cells uh, but it's just due to the output of, of myself that I've, mm -hmm. I've, I've written so much stuff uh, that I can go back and find stuff that I, I have no... So it's, it's very interesting to have no context. Uh, it's interesting that there's some stuff, uh, as we were listening to it, you just uh, oh, aimed, I, aimed it out. That's my... I, I yeah. call it my... It, it's a, it's a curse. Like, I, like you, I have songs and parts of songs. When that part came up, I knew it was coming. I knew it was coming. And I haven't heard that song for years either. Yeah, I'm uh, kind of, uh, uh, I don't know why it ended up being on the second song. I have less memories of that than uh, the other songs, that were, uh, like This Is Not Emily and uh, um, uh, Games. I have uh, more sort of specific. I, I love the out, though, of uh, This Cooler Heads Prevail. I love yeah, sort of semi-bionic. Yeah, I love sort of that uh, stuff. It probably could have gone on further. Yeah, yeah it's fun. Spacey. Very cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I just, I always say, you know, how would you do it now? Like, what, you know, what instruments would you use? Because uh, I, I hear them, and, and the, you know, because it's funny how you always think now you're so much more sophisticated than then, but, you know, you were in the height of your young creativity then. Like, there's nothing wrong with the art. It's, it's just the material that was used to reproduce the art. Yeah, so I, I would say that just when you're dealing with pop songs, you, you sort of have two foundations. You have your backing tracks and then you have your vocals, right? So a lot of the backing tracks have that sort of very virtual, uh, what were they, 8-bit or 16-bit sort of sounds that we were listening to and stuff yeah, like sure that? Yeah, sure they were 16-bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, a lot of the sounds that I was trying to get were uh, were, were trying to emulate like a honky-tonk piano. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I listen to it with now. With eight-note polyphony. With, so, yeah, Polyf yeah. Polyphony. And really, so if you had a real piano player, he, uh, no doubt I was I was having, like, uh, um, I remember now, I, I was having, it would probably would be, like, two piano parts all playing. Like, it would be uh, me just copying things and just using uh, every octave and every... Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I had no... What, what's the word? I had no... Um, no uh, governor. I, yeah, I had no governor at all. I was all in. It was just like porn city for me on That's the uh, keyboards. That's what I was that piano player. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. Because you're yeah. manic. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so average. And, and, and the thing is, it was all uh, step-timed in. So the... The, the, there's no lag or no sort of feel Keyboard to it. Keyboard players don't have the luxury of being able to step in time <laughs> no, and the guitar uh, part, uh, right? No, everything was just being... Yeah. It was like, fucking robotic. Isn't it funny that we, we are string players, we're guitar and bass players, and yet the beauty is that we can step time drums and we can step time keyboards, so there ain't nothing we can't do. Yeah. Unfortunately, if you're, a, you know, if you're a drummer or a keyboard player, this is the, guitar, the string instruments are so manipulative that you have to be able to kind of emote on it a bit 
Even if it's as lame as me or you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, if I were to do it again, it would be sort of a skittle version. I, I, I can hear just sort of a skittle with... I can hear the, 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 the piano at a, at, at a pub sort of in the background. Mm-hmm. Well, that's and, what uh, I think you always intend. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just one of those old... You said uh, the guy you want to drink on the piano and have a smoke in his mouth yeah, yeah, with w- the thing wrapped around yeah, his arm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> just one of those old old mics and uh, and somebody doing sort of the background. So, yeah. It, it, it had more punch to it for sure. Well, I'll tell you there what. There you go. That's pretty good. That That's uh, uh, Cooler Heads Prevail, and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take a break, get ourselves a new coffee, and we're going to go to the next song, which is uh, Even Cows Come Home. Holy which geez, That please. sounds weird on its own, so we'll catch you up next song. Thank you. Pinch us with barefoot and in slow motion. Jingle jangle. Well, we're back, and we're going to move on to song number four off Bite Down Hard, which is Even Cows Come Home. Well, I love the title. I have faint memories of this song, but I think uh, obviously uh, it seems very Byronic title to me. Uh, um, yeah, it's sort of my uh, uh, faint um, uh, subject matter of uh, personal uh, of personal relationships that probably don't. Uh, uh, don't work out. So, uh, yeah, even cows come home. I think that's a subtle thing of my <clears> father. <throat> okay. There's a little insight. Um, it's funny, like, when I'm checking out movies to watch, <laughs> I'll pick them just on the title. You know, so when I'm listening to songs that I don't know and I see the title, I'm always trying to figure, well, what is this about? Like, yeah. Even cows come home. Yeah. Have you got any good guesses? We're going to listen. Very curious to listen to this. I think it employs some good old-fashioned studio tricks, too, right off the top. Yes, I think it could have been a lot worse than what it, we're, we're going to hear, if, if I remember, and I'll, I'll explain it after, we, uh, after you play it. Okay, here we go.
we had to get backwards keyboards out of our system. So that's the one thing I do remember about the song. There's a lot that I don't remember. I, I, I'm hearing it for the first time in like 20, 25 years, so there's a lot I don't remember about it. I, I'm slightly impressed with the songwriting. Uh, just there's some modulation changes uh, after our I last I was going to say the last, yeah. the last verse when you added, it wasn't a modulation change, but you added another yeah. weird mod of the harmony vocal, which gave it the feel of a modulation, but it really wasn't. Um, right, so uh, I do remember uh, your sampler that you had, and this was a keyboard, it was just a piano sample. <coughs> I do remember you had the floppy disks, and uh, you had to load it up. I don't know how many floppy disks it took for you to load up I the sampler. I think it was four for the piano. Four for the piano. Because it was a four second sample and it was the four sections of the keyboard. Right, so I think there could have been a lot more uh, backwards piano on this. I think I remember at one point, um, so like I love things in reverse and I to this day I love things in reverse. To this day, even as I do songs, I always tend to put a little thing in reverse, uh, whether it's a guitar hit or something like that. I just love that sort of mystic otherworldly uh, sounds of switching sound files and stuff like that. So. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, listening, uh, I think I had written the piano part on the MIDI and I think I remember one day uh, playing it back with, uh, in reverse, uh, having the chords play in reverse with my vocals. I think uh, I do remember specifically loving the whole sort of uh, crazy mm -hmm. sort of zombie-like sound and stuff like that. I, I, and I do remember that we had to cut it back at some point. Um, so. Um, the dr a couple things I hear uh, the vocals. This would be a, a wonderful song to do live. I mean, there's a lot of uh, melody going on in uh, in sort of the riffs and stuff like that, um, and a couple of really nice changes to my ears uh, for a, sort of a first listen. Yeah, uh, a number of things. You know, you always tend to hear the things that you think you like. I'm always listening to those written drum parts I go holy shit buddy stop with the splash symbol all that it was was it driving up the wall oh my god again there was only certain and I actually heard we were using so many notes even on the drum machine that just instruments cut off like in some of those high uh, uh, symbol go just because I'm, I'm hitting so many things and I could hear brushes in with regular kit uh, so you hear those kind of things. The piano, you can hear some of the notes cut off, but in, in the piano sense, I feel that it works because it gives it that creepy kind of... <laughs> so if you lose polyphony, eh, it kind of works in that sense, you know. Um, <clears throat> yeah, wonderful sort of ending with the drums. Like, to me, I, I think that uh, with that sort of cacophony of uh, drum fills and stuff at the end, um, yeah, I can hear myself doing this song live and having a big freaking ending uh, where everybody's going crazy and stuff like that. And there's that chant, what could have been, should have been. Mm -hmm. I'm slightly curious about the lyrics. I don't know what I was writing about. It was about two people and Yeah, it doesn't something. sound like it's a healthy relationship. I, what I love are the lyrics you dropped in there. It says, she takes a beating as he forces her to love him. Yeah. That is, that's twisted. But I mean, it's twisted, but it, it, it 
chimes out as loud today as it did back then as it probably did in the 30s you know I mean yeah the song sort of goes on a bit long but uh, I still love some of the chords like it, it, to me uh, I'd do it again it would be like take off a lot of the verb and just sort of have it more sort of in your face uh, more that's punchy and stuff like so that's sort of the thing about this uh, sort of the ennui as I say sort of the feel of this album there's a lot of reverb and stuff like that um uh yeah yeah but it's context right so we, we can say that yeah, with a happy face that and whatever that was big yeah and i so having reverb and stuff like that i i, I think as the years have gone on uh certainly i know my vocals I, I i tend to do everything dry now just completely dry um uh because of that sort of reverb i might put one reverb on a drum or one instrument or mm -hmm. stuff like that everything else is really sort of in your face so there's a lot of reverb, but uh, again, this is uh, sort of the first album that we're putting together and stuff like that. Uh, again, I, I, I listen to the end. Uh, there's some wonderful things. A lot of stuff listening to this, I can't remember doing. I, it's sort of the chord changes and what the song was about. I'm really intrigued by it. I'm trying to... Uh, I also really like in the... Uh the bridge parts, the portamento of that zanzum, 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 and I was thinking, how do we work the portamento out? It was probably on a DX100. I also know we had the Yamaha SPX90 multi effects unit, and that had the pitch shifter when you went into the middle A, you went, Ooh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah, and you can tell as well, uh, this is something else that. Um, uh, it probably needs to be finessed, like a lot needs to be taken out. It, it, it's it's another uh, production of me using the kitchen sink. So um, I can hear a lot of uh, keyboard stuff. There's a lot of cool riffs in it where it's just the drums and the keyboard. But even that sort of that harpsichord sound, I can mm. hear multiple um, octaves on it some places. Uh, I was, uh, uh, yeah, again, I, I had no uh, governor on my... Uh, uh, I do also remember you playing <clears throat> the slow kind of plump plump guitar. It's like plump 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 And hearing you play that a lot, because I don't think you were totally confident in your guitar playing, so you'd be playing that. And I even today, like when I hear that back, I hear you being unsure of your meter plunk along with the guitar, which is interesting. You know, you can hear it and sense certain things. Just because I know someone so well and you were there, uh, I remember you struggling to, you know, that's a, that's a weird tempo just to be playing a steady plunk plunk on the guitar, right? Yeah, I I, I have no doubt. Um, I love some of the chords. There's a lot of smoky chords in there that I'm, mm -hmm. I'm hearing and stuff like that. Um, to me, hearing that would be like a, of the two, well, both songs that we've played today um, sort of should be uh, pull back a bit, but the, the, this song in particular really interesting. It's just the lyrics, like it's about two people fighting and stuff like that. Something must have been going on or something like that. Uh, yeah, strange that I can't. Well, it's interesting. <laughs> when you think of cooler heads prevail than even cows come home, like there's definitely some type of swirl in the drain going on here. Um, another thing that I find very interesting is that. Probably if you stripped away so many things of all these songs, we always loved those grinding drones underneath everything. And I knew when it was coming to the end going, I know what I'm going to hear at the end is again, you know, like on so many of the songs, which I'm a sucker for. We always love the Eastern style drones. Again, so uh, so it's, it's, it's a highlight. I, I for sure the title, uh, I... I I must have started the song off that uh, just the even cows come home. All alone as he works late, even cows come home. So it's like even later than that. Jeez, where does it come from? It's strange. Hey, listen to this stuff. You can't even remember what. Uh, what? I don't know why I would write about something like that. Um, well, like I said, I think you. It seems to me that you're you're very <clears throat> lyrically visual. You know, you're trying to. Was there something going on in your life or something like that? Was there something going on in somebody's life that I would? Uh, mm -hmm. It, it sounds like an abusive relationship, that song. Um, well, you'd have to answer that and to say, I, I, I have never been a big lyric person, so I didn't really concern myself too much with that. Mine was the, you know, musical visuals. <laughs> yeah, it sounded like it'd be a fun song to sing live. Like, I can hear myself uh, at one point trying to sound like, uh, 
doing soft vocals and then the other parts of the song I'm, I'm screaming my head off or, or whatever like that but that which always reminds me of playing live and stuff like that uh, yeah so that's that's the big kick I, I get out of that is I you know I'm getting also a flashback of doing those really mysterious sounding verses when it's going and I think one of us was playing the chord and maybe you were pushing the whammy bar because it gives it that during that kind of weird feel and I think, because I know there's a few times when I'd be playing stuff and you'd be pushing the whammy bar at the same time to affect some kind of weird sound. And I So we did that uh, uh, much, eh? Like, I, I remember the wah-wah pedal. Mm -hmm. I, I remember once pushing down on the pedal while you were right. uh, playing the guitar and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. It was always like a two-man job and stuff like that. Yeah, so Because it can be, right? We weren't doing something we couldn't replicate live. So I didn't have to worry about, you know, being ridiculous on the whammy bar or the pedal while trying to play something that makes sense. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's what I have to say. Uh, I, generally, that's uh, um, all I can think about. Uh, the lyrics, again, uh, uh, really intrigue me. I will look forward to uh, this week. Uh, we'll be putting the lyrics up for this album. Yeah, I'd like so, to put it up in its entirety and, and let the lyrics come up with it. So, so that's what we will be doing this week. And I'll, I'll, I'll be just as intrigued just by my lyrics by themselves or whatever like that. Um, and I hate to do this, but I'm always looking forward. You know, for the people that don't know the album, the next uh, song we'll be looking at is "Deep Soft Dark Earth." Sure, we can do that. I think we can uh, finish off this session with that song if you want to okay. listen to it. Um, yeah. I can't. I don't remember anything about that song either. But um, is there something I specific? can preface it quickly here? Deep soft dark earth track number five. I'm sorry, four on the album. Um, no, track num number five. Excuse me. It was your attempt to do a live song. Oh, okay. So I, I did not know that. Um, so this is you know faked to be a live song. And the funny thing is that for a couple of years. Byron played in a band I was very closely associated with, the Hooblers, which we got a whole series coming up on the Hooblers. But Byron was a Hoobler for a couple of years. <coughs> Excuse me. And so, uh, just because I, wa I want to see if anybody can notice when we do play this back, <coughs> beginning of the song, which is a fake live situation. Is it? Yeah. Our little gag was that the Hooblers just played at the festival that we're playing at here in Deep Soft Dark Earth, and the fans love them. And just before the song starts, if you can pick it out, you can hear Byron going, wait, I think I broke a string. And then, <laughs> and then the song starts. Uh, I didn't know what we were doing. Uh, so uh, when I grew up, sort of uh, uh, an epiphanous moment was uh, the Elton John song, uh, Benny and the Jets, which uh, big fan of Elton John growing up too, and stuff like that. And uh, I remember always hearing that song on the radio, and uh, it's got sounds like him playing live and stuff like that. I always assumed it was a live track until one day somebody uh, said uh, <coughs> that was a studio track and they put all live uh, uh, audience sounds on it and stuff like that. I thought that was the coolest studio thing I'd, I'd ever... I always remember that, finding that out and thinking that was just very cool. So mm. I, for sure that is... Uh, me thinking that now we can do something live and stuff like that. So the other thing was that I enjoy doing always in in, in my four track and bringing this is bringing in sort of making it theatrical sounding, right? It was always bringing in sound effects and stuff like that, and uh, really things had broken open for us. So I was sampling and stuff like that. I don't know if there's crowd sounds. Where 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 would we have got them from? Anywhere maybe perhaps off the television. <coughs> uh, we were that. Uh, like I had some sound effects, so I'm sure I had some crowd sounds, big festival right. sounds. But we weren't. I don't uh, want to give too much away. No, but we would even take stuff off the television too. Oh, for sure. Like I mean, in a future episode, we'll feature the song. That That's Lucifer. right. Eh? You're gonna hear. And we took crazy something off. Uh, oh, yeah, and we don't was, even know. Uh, all right, well, uh, we'll play this. Uh, and just so oh, someone's yeah. gonna say, who is that? This is Byron performing the slide guitar because uh, I wasn't up to do it. There's slide on this? <laughs> Wait, no here we way. go. Deep, soft, dark earth. Yes,
Had that the single person clapping at the end. Oh. <clears throat> Anyways, that's Deep Soft Dark Earth, and uh, Byron's car is gonna smash, so we're gonna take a break here. So we just listened to Deep Soft Dark Earth. Initial impression. Well, I can't. Uh, um, uh, it's, it's wonderful in, in as a song. I'm listening to it. It sounds wonderful. It just mm -hmm. really sounds like a wonderful live song that could be sung very coolly. I think uh, I was very impressed, sort of, sort of with sort of the foundations of uh, the song itself. I thought it was just a nice <coughs> little pop song. Um, I like the alliteration of the title. I like uh, deep, soft, dark earth. I, mm -hmm. I, that sounds very pliable. Um, I it sounds like it's something that I. Had, heard in the ether uh, I do I read a lot uh, four yeah. words four syllables it's nice yeah I'm always looking for things like that that yeah. just sort of have a bit of a, a movement to it and stuff like that so um, I always thought your lyrics were almost more predicated on rhythmic structure than they were on you know the prose value of the well prose itself has a, you know a poetry itself has meter to it um mm -hmm. you go in in literature uh, especially poetry they talk about all different types of meters and and uh um rhyme couplets and all sort of different types of things the iambic pentameters of songs and stuff like that so pop songs in themselves um, you're just trying to fit sort of syllables into sort of a so you think of uh, like the Beatles I'm the walrus uh, it's just sort of the, that sort of gobbledygook coming out of the of the mouth uh, very sort of rap like you know kids do so it today the Pritchard yeah yeah <laughs> well, well kids talk about it there's a rhythm to uh, speech today uh, that mm -hmm. uh, in rap uh, so I guess uh, that's just part of the of the thing um, I'm listening to the bass line on that. Um, mm -hmm. I think it be it sounds like it'd be really fun to do live. It does sound like a good kind of little live song. Right? That's a that's that's a, a bass part that is perfect for what it's meant to do, which was push it along as a, as as like uh, you know it, ha it has that uh, like urgency. Yeah, you know, to yeah, get, to get going. yeah. Yeah, it sounds uh, very interesting. It'd, I'd be curious to hear this guy do something live now with that. Um, I think it'd be more in your face, but I think it'd be it, it, very melodic sounding, very sort of McCartney-ish. Uh, well, yeah, it, it, again, it's the zoom, 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 zoom. Yeah, so I'm listening to this, and then we get to the middle eight, and then uh, we get to... Um, it sounds like we spend as much time on the middle eight as we did with the rest of the song, because I'm listening to the middle eight, and so this is one of the things 
So there's a little circus thing in there, isn't it? There's a spoken part by John Cook. A great friend of ours, a John A friend of ours Cook. who was in the Hooblers. <clears throat> uh, yeah. He played bass in the Hooblers. John is the founder of the Hooblers. John is the founder of the Hooblers. And, of course, he'd be another uh, person that would be going through the studio. And at some point, uh, mm-hmm. John, be, uh, John, from what I remember, John would be uh, willing to do anything for us. Uh, uh, he was a very... Uh, he wrote that the, the book there. John's um, an author. Yeah, John's a very sort of prolific... Uh, he has a trilogy out in four parts. Yeah. He'd <laughs> so, like a bon vivant, wouldn't he? Uh, John's a bon vivant. Yeah. He would like that to be... He's Esquire. John Cook Esquire. Absolutely. Uh, well, we always had friends coming in to contribute things, and they were more than happy to, because they all shared the same admiration of Byron's stuff that I did, and so... It was just a great, joyous time whenever anybody came around because we <laughs> would obviously find something for people to do. We were never short for extra things for people to do. Yeah, trying to get different textures on the album, for sure. Just hearing a different voice on there makes me happy. So, I think of a, of a poignant lyric in there to reference to what John is doing. You have, there's someone God has missed. Which is so sad. And John's talking about, he's on the on the, uh, the the Swiss roll bob or whatever yeah, it is, yeah. the thing is going, you want to go faster? Yeah. Now we're going to go backwards. And I think that's like a juxtaposition of the craziness of... Yeah, I... I um, and someone God has missed. I'm kind of enamored with my uh, lyrics. I don't remember doing a lot of them, but uh, yeah, obviously that was a really important part, especially my first album. I want to make sure I got my uh, lyrics right. But uh, sort of, I, I like the idea of the middle eight. It's very Byronic and stuff like that. It's... Uh, but I hear uh, sort of the constraints of the uh, the, the click track, the fact that uh, that session probably, first listen, probably should have been slowed down and, and sort of the dynamics of, uh, of a song, just sort of let that sort of a circus part maybe just sort of play out a bit longer and stuff like that and then mm-hmm. kick the song back in. So it's, it's not very robotic when that part, and it almost, it, that as I said, we probably spent more time in that one small part than the rest of the song. And it goes by so quick, eh? Like, mm-hmm. you, you, you can't even make... Uh, uh... Well, at the time, our, our tempo mapping with the tones was very limited. Yeah. Like it was hard to get the machine to slow down in a humanistic manner. And yeah. we always felt it was awkward and we did that. Yeah, I feel very much, uh, listening to this album, that we were really pushing uh, the boundaries as much as we could. And uh, so, uh, listening to uh, that now, so uh, what I would say that I- I've learned that um, uh, uh, I-, I would have scaled it, going if-, if I could do it again, knowing what I know now, uh, with the instruments that we would have had in your studio, I think I would have scaled it back a bit, um, not tried as hard to put as much uh, of that stuff on. Uh, not put the kitchen sink on and uh, just sort of let because I'm hearing a lot of melody and I'm hearing a lot of uh, nice lyrics and stuff like that and um, that sort of underpinning there's a lot going on underneath and I think uh, yeah it, it, it's, it, it there seems to be no breathing room to me when I'm listening to this it, it's very very heavy very undulating uh, lots of shit going on on the bottom sounds like the guys had a good time putting it together uh, um, but yeah, I'm hearing uh, I'm hearing uh, some cool songs with some cool chord changes and some wonderful lyrics, but it seems very heavy. Uh, I'm hearing a lot of double and triple vocals, uh, lead vocals. I'm hearing a uh, quadruple backing vocals myself. So there's a lot of too much Byron and stuff like that. But uh, uh, it's just for, for me. Uh, um, I just wish that there wasn't such a preponderance of reverb and. Uh, we really needed to contain the low end. Yeah, so. there's it, there's a wash going on, a, a, a patina to uh, to this that it's very sort of similar and stuff like that. It's too bad that um, no, we haven't listened to the whole album. And I think each song on their own probably might stand on their own. But I think yeah, if uh, a lot of that wash got taken away, um, I think the more in your face, especially the vocals and stuff like that. However, um, to get to where I am today or to keep doing it, I had to go. Th- go through this happily and uh, there's a again it sounds uh, um, listening to it on these speakers as opposed to when I remember listening to it on my ghetto blaster 
Uh, I didn't hear this wash of reverb, this sort of high end. And I don't know whether, again, whether this is a remastered version. Uh, yeah, that's unfortunate. Um, I'm not sure. I'm going to find the best versions I can to basically overlay those, what we were listening to. So I'll try to, in the episodes, I'll try to give you the best version I can find. So maybe it'll be a little better. Again, we're hearing it, you know, pretty loud up in front of our faces and... Yeah, so I'm uh, curious about some of my chord changes too in that song. Um, uh, but I'm really uh, thrilled at the verses. I think the verses sounded uh, wonderful, and I, I really get that idea across from being a live song. It would have been a wonderful song to sort of sing live, having that bass part, and uh, mm -hmm. it, was, it seemed very melodic to me and stuff like that. Um, yeah, a very traditional sort of song uh, template. Uh, all these songs seem to have a proper middle eight. Uh, they all seem, uh, oh, yeah. they all seem sort of verse chorus or verse bridge chorus, verse bridge chorus, middle eight. Uh, they all seem very sort of. Um, but th this one is more of a joyous song, if you ask me, than as, as your sort of masked happy music with bizarro. Kind yes, of pressing lyrics. This is more of a positive. Yes, it sounds yeah. almost uh, very. Even someone's God's mist. It's still a positive song. It's like the Baptist uh, it seems very sort of. Uh, um, uh, like as well, people will have the benefit of having read the lyrics as they're listening to it, right? Because right, was there elegiacal? Is that a word? It's, it, no, uh, no, sort of. Uh, um, uh, just the deep, soft, dark earth. It seems like uh, you, you you could sing it in, in a church, or, or the lyrics seem very sort of uplifting, uh, like being in a Baptist church. Like, uh, is that a word, elegiacal? Is, sort of, is that... Uh, 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 it seems like a... YouTube viewers, elegiacal. <laughs> is that like... Uh. Uh, I'll cut that part out for sure. I no, well, it's it's thought. interesting. So, so, so my wordplay, like I get, and I get uh, a lot of this where I don't know whether these, where some of these words come from, and I'm always constantly, uh, um, they're called like malaprops, where you don't get the word proper and you're saying it sort of uh, in the wrong way or something. Uh, I, I, I get, I'm constantly dealing with that with the English language like that. Um, elegiac, yeah. Like I don't well, think I got that. The happy mistakes, right? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah, music, yeah. Like lyrically, like the happy mistakes, the happenstance of sounds and and, and vowels and syllables, the way they. Right, right, around. right. So uh, 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 an album I did, Koi Paradiso. Uh, the whole album was made up of titles of uh, of, uh, of names I, I I just made up. It was just words, sort of. You Latin. said it was one word titles. It was like that. Those um, what's the thing on the computer? Ipsum lorem. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Those ipsum lorem. Text, yeah. yeah. It was like it was, it was like a generator. It was just like making sounds and stuff like that. So uh, yeah. So the fact that I'm saying elegiacal, you're going to take this out. Um, it is kind of it is me being me. Uh, yeah, I don't get the words proper. Um, if it means something to you, then it means something. Uh, yeah, so uh, that's what I get. Uh, it, it was wonderful to listen to. Uh, both of these are very court, sort of chordy and stuff like that. Uh, love to sort of read. Uh, almost makes me want to, and I wouldn't because uh, those were the songs I did at that time. But uh, it makes me musically would love to sort of at least remix it or something like that. Um, um, and take some of all that sort of sheen off the vocals. And it's stuff interesting. Like that. I know that when um, you know I've gone back in my jams or whatever, and someone said, "Let's do that song from the Hubler album," and I go back and it's like I can hear it perfectly in my head. Um, I haven't got a clue where to start with my part right now. Do you find this when you pick things up, or do you just because it's naturally a Byronic effort? No, I have no, you, you no. Go, oh, that's probably this. And just no, start I have no, so, no. So there's some no. things you go, what was I playing? No, so it's just, it's a day to day thing, right? So like you just sort of get in the moment, you sort of figure your part out, you record it. Um, the next day, if you were to ask me like, what the hell were you doing the day before? I can't remember. You, it's very much of the moment. Like mm -hmm. I, I completely forget. My headspace will be elsewhere. Yeah, I can't. Um, so that's sort of the thing about being in the studio, right? It's not something that you want to keep practicing again and again. You just want to go in, mm -hmm. you, you want to sort of sort it out in your right. head. It's got to be fresh. Yeah, and you want it as fresh as you can. You want mm -hmm. that demo uh, mode uh, to go. So yeah, yeah. You, you don't want to be practicing. Uh, what a wonderful thing. Um, um, yeah, so there's, there's that song. Yeah, so that brings us up to, well, we're done with half the album now. So that's going to bring us up to Dance, Scratch, and Claw on the next one. And then Hitler. 
<laughs> I hate to say it, there are people going, what? Uh, the full song title is The Last Days of Hitler Were Like the First Days with You. So, yeah, it's interesting that the, the word Hitler was used and stuff like that. So, I grew up in the 60s. So, at the time, uh, that sort of Nazism was sort of mocked in a funny way. I grew up with Hogan's Heroes, which was... Uh, Monty Python. P yeah, people yeah. didn't... Uh, uh, so, if you uh, d didn't grow up with that era, Hogan's Heroes, go watch it on YouTube. Um, yeah, they make fun of the Germans and stuff like that. Uh, the, 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 uh, I used to go, I used to love to go watch uh, early Woody Allen films all the time. I was a big fan of Woody Allen. So he was sort of the neurotic Jew and he'd always throw in sort of Hitler lines and stuff like that. And uh, so it was always sort of like a funny thing going on and stuff like that. So my best friend growing up, he was Jewish. And so it was always this sort of shtick, you know, about Hitler and stuff like that. And uh and all, all the uh, uh, gay Nazis and the homosexual Nazis and uh, all their proclivities and uh, stuff like that. So, yeah, it was uh, uh, and, uh, probably an attempt at humor. I had gone out with a girl that was uh, of um, uh, German origins. And uh, so, yeah, I, I think that was my little uh, hmm. throw on it. But Interesting. Okay, well, well, I guess we'll leave that till next session. Sure. If that okay, be. so that gets us a little farther in, so uh, we'll catch up with you for the next song. I'm glad we're doing it.